So Emmett and I have been talking about having a leadership panel for about five years. Before we get into it, I just want to say 11 years ago when this started, cardiology, orthopedics, they had sessions where we could come together with industry, but we didn't have one in ophthalmology where you brought the financial world, the medical world, and the industry world together. Now 11 years later, we have this. And I really want to say, Emmett, congratulations and thank you. And Bill, for all the hard work that you've done, it takes an enor enormous amount of effort to put this together. And Emmett, I would like to thank you very much for the coveted 440 time slot. It's wonderful. <laughs> OK, so leadership. Let's talk about leadership. We've got a great panel here. We've got small team, uh, professional athlete who's been there. We've got a big pharma executive. We've got a serial entrepreneur in medical devices. We've got a process manager equivalent, to the, the second to none. But I want to start. I've asked them all to introduce themselves and tell you a little story about leadership. But I want to start by telling you my own leadership story and how I got introduced to leadership. In 1978, I was a sales rep for a pharmaceutical company down in Atlanta, Georgia. And one of the preservatives in our drugs uh, was causing a lot of problems. And the professor at Emory University was publishing studies about the uh, problems with this preservatives. And I kept reporting to my manager, hey, I'm getting killed out here. What, what, you know, we got to do something. This preservative's causing a big problem. Worked my way up to the regional manager. He said, I can't help you. Worked my way up to the vice president of sales. And finally, I got the president of the company on the phone. And it, at that stage in my career, I might as well have been talking to God himself. I was so nervous, I thought, but finally, finally, I'm going to get the answers I need. I'm going to get enlightened. And I explained the problem to the, the boss, and he said, Corley, your job is to fight adversity, not report it. <laughs> that, ladies and gentlemen, is authority. That is not leadership. And when you're talking about leadership, never get those two confused. So with that, I'll ask our panel to start their, introduce themselves. Kurt, why don't we start with you and work our way around? These are uh, sure, so I'm Kirk Nielsen. I'm with Vinsana Capital, which is a new med tech focused venture firm that was launched earlier this year. Before that, spent 13 years at uh, Merson Ventures with Bill and Charles Warden and others on the med tech um, team there. Um, with respect to leadership, Andy asked me to, to share something back from, from my vault, which is back when I was playing hockey. And the first person I thought of when uh, he asked me was a guy named Ray Bork. And some of you from Boston and, and others will know uh, who that is. He's one of the best hockey players of all time and was the longtime captain, I think, for 20 years or so of the Boston Bruins. And when I was out of college, I had a chance to play hockey for a living for a few years. and, and um, spent a little bit of that time with Boston playing, um, or in Boston playing with, with Ray. And this guy was just the consummate leader. Um, he was a, a lead by example sort of guy, kind of a role model type leader, which for me is the best kind. And I, I don't have enough time to go into all the attributes um, that he had, but for me it was just a lesson in, in, in how to lead, watch him you know, lead that team and lead that locker room. And I think what stood out for me is he made every person in that room feel whether they were a 50 goal scorer, they were someone like me who was just trying to stick around for another day, or they were the equipment manager. He made them feel like they were just a huge part of the success of that team and created a, a culture in that locker room where people would go through walls for each other. And as we all know, that's what leadership's all about. So for me, who was kind of an impressionable 22, 23 year old, to see that up close and personal was just a great experience. Thanks, Kurt. You're the president of the Venture Capitalist uh, Former NHL Players Association, right? Okay. And a two, maybe. <laughs> Adrian. I'm Adrian Graves, and I had a bit of an unconventional route to CEO. I was always interested in math and science, and I was never teased about it, and I never thought it was unfeminine. And in fact, I thought that girls were better at math and science than boys because all the way through junior high and high school, the football team and other dudes would come to me for tutoring in math and sciences. I, I would have helped you, Andy. Thank you. <laughs> I needed it. And so I went on in, in college and graduate school and a postdoc uh, studying science, visual science. 
And right out of a postdoc, I went to Alcon, started Visual Function Lab. That was kind of an unconventional thing at that point, too, because that was in the late 80s. And back then, it was considered that if you were a PhD, and especially if you did a postdoc, the only noble thing was to go into academia. But Alcon recruited me right out of a postdoc to start a visual function lab, and I decided, wow, the facilities are amazing. I thought the salary they were paying me was amazing <laughs> at the time. It actually wasn't, but I, uh, I, I made the jump, and it was a very good decision because I became fascinated with the pharmaceutical industry and how drugs were developed and was given a lot of opportunities and different roles and responsibilities and international responsibilities. I did notice, though, when I first got there, I've got to admit, I did notice, there were zero women VPs. And I counted, of course, I actually counted, the number of VPs throughout the company globally, and it was a, a huge number, no women. It didn't affect my experience there, but in the back of my mind, it sort of planted a seed that I might have to make a move in order to accelerate my path to VP, because at the time I thought, well, of course I want to be a VP. I mean, that's kind of the living end, isn't it? <laughs> and uh, so I did get the opportunity when Santen a large Japanese ophthalmic company, decided to globalize. And they recruited me as a VP of clinical and then of R&D and then of worldwide clinical development. And I, uh, so the US and Europe and Japan reported to me. I reported to the global CEO in Japan. And uh, so, so far, so good, right? And then he asked me to be CEO of the US business. And I said no, because I didn't feel perfectly qualified. And the rest of, my, the, rest of the executive team came to me and said, you got to do this, Adrian. We don't want to report to these people we're interviewing. And so I confided in my dear friend, Judy Gordon. I don't know if she's out there. Many of you know her, and I told her my dilemma, and she basically kicked me in the butt and said, are you nuts? Of course you're qualified, and there's not a man in the world that would turn down a CEO position, regardless of qualifications. <laughs> so, <laughs> so just do it. And I did. I was CEO for eight years. I'm awfully glad I did it. Uh, was it, I learned so much, it opened a lot of doors to me. Uh, I'm now uh, on a number of corporate boards, and uh, my dear friend Dick Lindstrom was the one to give me my first uh, corporate board opportunity. Most of my boards are in the ophthalmology world, which is still my passion, uh, still my love, and uh, it's, it's wonderful to be able to hang out with so many of my colleagues every year. Thank you, Adrian, thank you. Ron? Um, well, my name's Ron Kurtz, and I'm with RX Sight. Um, my background is I'm an ophthalmologist by training, uh, but I've been working in industry now for over 20 years, and I guess uh, I'm that man that would say to take that CEO position, uh, the first, uh, first experience was when uh, a colleague, Tibor Juhas, and I started a company at University of Michigan. There were only two of us, so one person was going to be the CEO and one person was going to be the CTO, and uh, I took the former. Uh, and I've, you know, continued along that track uh, working, and uh, every once in a while my, my kids, primarily my daughter, would ask me, well, gee, what do you do? as a CEO, and it's very hard to explain. Uh, you know, you do whatever needs to get done. But I was recently reading uh, a book on uh, uh, primates, primate behavior, where uh, it kind of explained what, uh, what, what you do. And it, this was a, uh, this is a, by a pretty well-known uh, primatologist, Fran DeWall, who um, has studied chimps primarily and looked at their behavior and how they choose leaders. Uh, and, you, you know, ch chimps are uh, uh, an alpha male 
society. Actually, the term alpha male w uh, was originated with chimps. Uh, and people think that that means that they're the big, tough guy that can uh, keep all the other chimps down. But it turns out that that's not the case uh, because any one chimp can get destroyed by two chimps. So uh, you ha the, the whole uh, idea of being a leader in the chimp world is that you have to uh, be able to maintain connections to everybody else in the troop. And the way they do that is two things. One is they spread around the food. When there's food available, they make sure everybody gets food. And the second is there's a lot of disputes in the chimp world, and so they have to be impartial. So the people who, the, the chimps that are successful leaders are impartial. And they just make a decision. They don't do it based on their family connection or anything. And uh, this was just a few months ago, and I think that's, that's what we do as CEOs. We just try to, <laughs> it's not much different than the chimp world. <laughs> Bernie. Great story, Ron. Um, th Andy, thanks for having me here. It's a, it's a pleasure and an honor. I'm Bernie Haffey uh, with, with Haffey and Company. Um, the story I'm going to tell is uh, one that goes back to Interlay's. Uh, Bill Link was our, our chairman, and uh, Bob Palmisano was our, our CFO. I'm, I'm sorry, our CEO. Uh, we had gone through an IPO, or a public company, uh, and so we each quarter we had a report card. Um, a 90-day report card to report in on our our sales, and I remember sitting in uh, in Bob's office in in, in Irvine uh, towards the end. Of, I think about three three days uh, before the quarter end, and he he asked me how I thought International was going to finish up, and I said, Bob, I uh, I don't know, and uh, his response was, Isn't that cool? How less is often more. And, uh, and what was behind that was uh, the idea that the result was going to come in. I had a choice. I could inspect that result. I could make a call to head of international and spend a half an hour and go through his sales funnel. And meanwhile, he's not producing revenue. He's, um, we're just, we've stopped production. We're inspecting. And that's cost. Um, and generally not quality. And so it was really kind of a mindset that we had um, that we didn't want to over-inspect. We had a weekly inspection. We weren't going to do any more than that. Uh, we we're going to let people do, you know, what they, uh, you know, what, uh, uh, what they need to do. And, and that's, you know, as, as, as we fast forward to where I am now, uh, in our consulting practice, we've engaged I think over 40 organizations around the world, from the largest in med tech to the smallest in med tech. And, and this uh, over-management of results uh, is something that, uh, that we see as uh, one of the largest wastes uh, in management versus understanding um, that over-inspection can, can be a detriment and that really, what's really important is understanding what, I think, what drives I think them. most people were trained in inspection management techniques and leadership techniques. In other words, there's a goal, there's a date, there's a name, and uh, measure, 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 where more and more we see process, process, process playing the role as the winning, techno of the winning process or the winning methods to get to an endpoint. Let me come back to Adrian real quick. Let's pull the string on that uh, climb up the ladder a little bit. Just, to, just for all the ladies in the audience, what are a couple of special challenges that you, you want to share with the team or share with the audience? I think there are some special challenges, certainly. One I alluded to is that women don't have as many role models in leadership positions and CEO positions. And so I think it's hard to imagine yourself somewhere where you don't see a role model. And I think that was part of it for me. I thought there was like a certain CEO personality and look and I wasn't fat and bald and so I just <laughs> didn't <laughs> see myself that way. <laughs> okay, thanks Adrian. <laughs> uh, <can> we... <laughs> but uh, but and uh, so, so that's one thing, uh, just kidding of course, that's just one thing, but uh, I think there are, there are a number of things that in and of themselves kind of seem subtle, but that can really affect women. I think we, women are scrutinized in so, women leaders are scrutinized in so many ways 
that men are not. We're scrutinized for our appearance, our hair, our clothes, our voice, our demeanor when we're being assertive or directive. And I think, for me, I, I basically ignored all those things, but I think that they can add up for women and be quite undermining for women as they're climbing the ladder. And then, you know, another thing, women that are mothers, they certainly have less hours to devote uh, to their leadership responsibilities. Um, and then I think most women who've come up in business and women physicians as well, uh, most of us have had Me Too moments and I'm not gonna discuss those, that's a whole nother topic. I probably could write a book. Uh, but all I will say is it does affect women. I'm hoping that it's changing in a, in a positive direction, but I will just say it's real. Okay, thanks for that. Um, I knew she was gonna be the star of this panel before we ever started. Um, Okay, so as leaders, is it always Vince Lombardi or General Patton or Margaret Thatcher? Let's run the video. Uh, I found that video some, somehow weirdly inspirational. <laughs> okay. So, uh, there would be no Walt Disney without Roy Disney. There would be no Warren Buffett without Charlie Munger. Panelist, how do you make yourself easy to follow? Don't be a jerk. <laughs> um, I, but I think that, now this is funny because I'm the only woman on the panel, I'm gonna make a sports analogy. Because <laughs> any of us that have played team sports, or if you, you, even if you've just watched team sports, you know that you're only as good as your team. I mean, just ask, LeBron James, who can score 51 points and lose a playoff game. So I think, you know, obviously, obviously the team's really important, and you, you hire talented people because they're talented, but then you got to listen to them. I think that's the key. Bernie? I like the simplicity uh, message, you know, that to be a leader, you've got to make it simple, and you've got to be easy to follow. Um, so that was one thing, and then uh, the second uh, the the second follower was even crazier than the first guy. He did a, a, a somersault and did courageous. a courageous courageous. He dove under the leader's legs, and he 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 said, "Oh, this is the dance we're doing. We're going to go even further with that, right?" Mm -hmm. And that I think is what a great number a great number two does. The CEO says, "We're we're going to do this," and number two says, "Well, okay, I'm not I'm in 110 percent on that." So Let's do more of that. And, and so, yeah, and we, if you don't have that number two, you really don't go anywhere. Right. Because it, that, that number two is undermining and doing everything to say, look how crazy the CEO is with this dance. Uh, let's just keep doing our, 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 uh, our stuff. It, it's, a, it's a formal versus informal leadership, right? In any team, sport, company, small group, there's the leader and they're the informal leaders. They all play a critical role. The informal leaders, in some cases, are more powerful than the actual leader. Uh, Harvard Business Review just uh, published a study where visionary leadership fails half the time, right? And it fails because middle management doesn't buy in. How do, how do you get them in the boat? I mean, how do, how do, you know, you got a big idea, the boss wants to see it roll downhill, there's a lot of people waiting with a lot of conflicting agendas. It's a big deal to get everybody on board. How do you do it? Ron? <laughs> you know, I guess I, um, I always come from a technical perspective that there's, uh, it's hard to know what the right thing to do is. And uh, oftentimes I don't know what the right thing to do is. And the way you figure that out is you get into the details of the project. And oftentimes it's somebody who knows the details better than you who comes up with the right idea and they're actually the leader. Uh, and so uh, I, I 
I'm not sure that that's a, uh, 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 an effective uh, uh, principle, but it's, it's, the way, it's the way things actually turn out. Uh, I remember when I was a medical student, uh, and I was a third year medical student on a trauma surgery team, uh, and it was a very busy night, it was a very busy hospital, and by the end of the night, there had been so many emergency surgeries and admissions that all of the residents, the attendings, they were all in surgery. So at the end of the day, at the end of the night, I was the only one who knew where all the patients were, and I was the third year medical student. And the next day when we rounded, they all had to follow me because I had the detailed knowledge of where people were and what surgery they had, et cetera. So it, you know, that's how things happen. Sometimes the, 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 the leader of your team is just whoever has the most information. Turt? Yeah, I mean, as I said, most of my experience has been with small teams, whether it's sports or whether it's business. And in my experience, at least, I think it goes back to what you said, Andy, around authority versus leadership. And, you know, I think as a leader, ask yourself the question, are people falling because they have to? You know, they're, they're afraid of finding their next job or they want to get their bonus at the end of the year or whatever it is, or they're following you because they want to. And I think Adrian said it well, which is I think half of being a good leader is just being the kind of person that people want to follow. You know, be a good person, um, be a decent person, um, be someone who works really hard as an example for others. And I think a lot of people get hung, hung up on kind of the trappings of leadership in terms of telling people what to do, more the authority. And I think forgotten is just be a good person that people want to, want to get behind and, again, go through walls for. Yeah, I think the authority versus leadership uh, comparison is an important one, right? Uh, you know, the, the studies show that uh, employees that are unhappy do one of two things. They disengage or quit. Disengagement's a lot more expensive than having someone quit, right? So the reason they disengage is they don't feel like their efforts are contributing to strategy, right? So... Uh, the empowerment of, of middle managers in the, uh, is just a critical role in the small teams that we lead. Now, in the room, we've had everybody today from the head of J&J &J down to one-man shops that are starting up. There are people in the audience that are wondering, like Adrian did, can I be a leader? Bernie, can you learn to be a leader? I think so. Ron's a good example of that. <laughs> <laughs> What does that mean? Yeah. <laughs> had to had to had to take a shot at Ron. Sorry, but no, I I do. You know, you you introduced me as as somebody who's process minded, and I I do think in those terms. And um, how you get that middle group in is a huge challenge, a persistent challenge. Um, and I do think you need a methodology for that. Uh, we know that if you just communicate, that's naive, right? Um, but it's necessary, and over communication is necessary. But it it goes to role model behavior, yep. right? Which is what our video is about. It goes to training and coaching. It goes to reward and recognition. It goes to whether they understand the purpose or the why. And if you can put all that together um, as a, as a tool, you can think I think a little bit more, in a more disciplined way about how you get those folks on board. Um, then just you know, sort of pounding the table and telling them they've got to get on board. Okay, let's wrap up here, running out of time. Uh, one pearl that you would offer a prospective leader. Adrian, you want to start us off? Only one? Well, we don't have time for one. We could talk about <laughs> leadership for four days and never cover about half of it. One quick pearl. Okay, well, I, I think basically the key to everything in life is uh, the relationship relationships and so I, I encourage people um, and uh, young people coming up to uh, form as many relationships especially with the leaders in your field go ahead meet them they're just people too uh, they it's it's amazing how how your your relationships and your friends can help you um, help others too as they're coming along, and uh, I think uh, I, I think that's really the the key to success in in business and in every other aspect of life. But I got to tell you, El, I got to tell you also, smile <laughs> because it'll make you happier, and it'll make the people around you happier, and 
the reason that people get promoted, you gotta be good, but you're usually promoted because people want you around. So be a pleasant person. Kurt? I would go back to the adage, which is A's hire A's and B's hire C's. And I think a lot of times we see, especially our young CEOs, not surround themselves with the best people that they can for various reasons. Um, and I think for me, it would come out of that. You know, get the best people on the bus that you can. The bus to Aveline. <laughs> <laughs> the bus to Aveline. Inside joke. Ron? I, I guess I would just say get into the details of uh, whatever project it is and you know the, the, the leadership is going to figure itself out uh, but try to solve the problems and, uh, and then uh, you know who, who leads it doesn't really matter. I'd like to thank you for supplying that home video that we watched a few minutes ago. It was very <laughs> nice of you. Which one was I? <laughs> <laughs> And Bernie Raffles, take us home here. I guess it would just be uh, to be a continuous learner. Uh, look at the evidence uh, that's out there, just the way a, a doctor would look at clinical evidence. Uh, leaders can look at, uh, at, at evidence. I think Jim Collins in Good to Great did that um, extraordinarily well and showed that level, what a level five leader looks like on, in an empirical way. And so I, don't, I see a lot of leaders that don't look at the evidence. And that's frustrating, right? Because it's out there um, based on results, you know, what good leadership looks like. So that would be my lesson, or my message would be to, you know, be a learner, look at, look at what best looks like outside this industry, um, and look at, uh, look at some of those stories and, and try to learn, uh, learn from that as well. Thanks everyone for your attention.